Yeah, so I try to be very like uh, kind of like precise and brief. I know there's like happy hour waiting for us. I, actually, there's two happy hours. There's the official one, and then there's the uh, the one what we are throwing with Maker uh, happy hour later today. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good, uh, nice time to switch the topic a bit. I mean, uh, we had like one and one and a half hours about privacy. So I think now everyone basically more or less uh, knows how to hide their uh, coins. <laughs> so we can basically talk about uh, something related to uh, DeFi. So the topic basically is uh, how staking as a service breaches uh, DeFi for mainstream. So we kind of like what we're trying to basically look today a bit of like DeFi in general, what it is, and kind of trying to uh, see like what kind of as aspects relates to DeFi, what is staking as a service, and 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 basically what what it has to do with uh, DeFi in general, and and kind of like think about like could this mechanism that and all these ingredients and pieces that we have here could this actually get more people uh, mainstream people into the decentralized finance products from centralized finance products like uh, bank deposits and, and, and so forth. So a couple of words about me. So uh, I was basically, I'm from Finland originally. Uh, I did some uh, uh, coding when I was in my teenagers, uh, but basically eventually ended up going for law school. And I was all, always kind of interested in different kinds of rules. And, and, and I was in the event called Slush in, in uh, Helsinki, uh, where I, I'm, I'm based, uh, originally based from. And, and basically there uh, I saw like first kind of like presentations and, and uh, developers building things on, on Ethereum. And this was back in 2015. So I got really excited about smart contracts. And I kind of like tried to apply those into like uh, legal, legal applications, but uh, found out that there's even more interesting stuff going on in financial uh, kind of services. And that kind of like uh, was a situation where I started to build uh, DeFi projects. And then basically I went to Reddit and Facebook and in Reddit I was pretty active uh, back in the days and in the Ethereum community and asked people that I have this great idea. Basically, it's kind of like crypto back loans. Uh, you place a collateral and then you borrow other asset and, and, and who wants to join? Well, it was a good idea, kind of like some people joined into the project and eventually some people were asking me, well, why, don't, why do you need to, uh, why would you basically stake your funds and borrow when you can sell? So the kind of like financial part was very difficult to grasp back in the day, but today everyone understands why would you deposit funds to compound or uh, some other protocol or why would you borrow against? And basically, well, the startup that we created was named Eatland. So it was uh, first lending protocol in Ethereum. And it was a very interesting project. Uh, basically, uh, we're still active. We have uh, basically 2 million worth of funds uh, in deposit. And basically, it's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer order matching uh, kind of like smart contract and marketplace for uh, crypto-backed loans. And uh, now we are known as Aave. So basically... Uh, we did a bit of rebranding and are creating basically uh, pooled ways of, of uh, uh, basically, well, concentrating the liquidity into pools and, and, and kind of like offer for the borrower fixed, uh, kind of swaps from fixed and variable rates and back and forth per block. So it's an kind of like a lending product uh, which we build on top of basic interest rate swaps. So that's like, um, that's the kind of like a bread and butter that we are doing now. Uh, but uh, more about DeFi. So there's a few things that we need to always like recognize. So what DeFi does is gives you a equal access to finance. So it should be openless. It should be censorship resistant. And uh, basically why I'm using the word should is because it's the kind of like the uh, status quo now. So you can use Compound, you can use Eatland, you can use basically DYDX uh, and all these lending protocols or Uniswap without giving much data. So there's not much restrictions, but I, I'm not sure how long it will be like this. I, I'm pretty sure that some part like there kind of there's this regulation, uh, I would say kind of like consensus that you maybe you have to do KYC. But now we kind of argue in DeFi that, hey, we're so decentralized. Uh, so we kind of, we don't control anything, but it's very, very arguable. And it's diffi difficult to say 
especially when we talk like stable coins, uh, CDPs, and the whole DeFi space. So uh, it's it's interesting to see like how this will evolve. And of course, uh, oh, let me just. <laughs> oh, you will see all my secrets now. So yeah, so control of your own funds. That's that's one very important thing. So you're interacting with DeFi. You basically control your funds. Uh, you're not giving away. You kind of understand like what will happen in a way that um, you're using non-custodial services. You know that the smart contract are smart contracts are pre-programmed. So so basically you um, you you know what kind of functions there are. There should not be surprises. But uh, if I quickly ask, like, how many of you guys know how to read smart contracts? Like in general, that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And the rest of the guys like me and <laughs> rest of you, like we probably don't know that much. So that's the thing. Like um, it's not kind of like democratic because it's code, and then you have people who don't understand code. So it's still uh, a bit of issue. But another thing is control of your per personal data. So if you think about it, if you are making a over collateralized loan, which is one of the main use cases, DeFi, or you want to trade uh, one token to another token, why would you need to submit uh, personal data like your uh, passport or your 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 um, uh, utility bill? You of course you need to do that for regulation, regulation and purpose. But actual like what what's the concept in decentralized finance is that kind of like you should be able to control the data or you should show it and. Uh, somehow that that you you are compliant and 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 your the data is still encrypted and and basically but like in idealistic level you should be able to control it and that's like the whole DeFi purpose and there's the transparency aspect so this is my favorite because like uh, there is a bunch of different kinds of lending protocols now which are not decentralized and the thing is you don't actually know what's going on there so you 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 kind of don't understand like how much others are paying for interest. Uh, and, and basically what kind of lending volumes there are so you can understand the market a bit better, get more competitive offers. It kind of fights a bit uh, back the idea of that we, what we had today, like the three talks about privacy and, and, and basically being able to secure that. But I definitely agree that privacy is very important, but there's also an aspect of transparency. But kind of like I would like to see like my transactions and my identity hidden, but also I would like to see the market as transparent as possible. I would like to see like what others are paying and if I am getting like the good uh, market price. And of course the counterpart risk mitigation. So basically you are interacting with smart contracts uh, since they're deployed in the public ledger. Basically there's a uh, certain uh, aspect of in immutability and, and basically, uh, what this allows to you to do is you don't need to trust the counterparty when you know how the code executes. And of course, the reduction of cost. Uh, some people argue a lot that, okay, when you're using Ethereum uh, blockchain, you're paying fees, you're paying gas, shitload of gas. But to be honest, like if you compare what are the costs running, for example, uh, centralized financial services, such as, for example, a bank or electronic money, uh, the cost of running electronic money operations, they're much higher than we have now in, in the gas costs, for example, on uh, the Ethereum. And the very very key, uh, do you guys recognize this logo? Who, who of you guys recognize it? What is it? What is it? Open source, yeah. So the, the whole thing of, of DeFi, what is interesting part, like uh, community-wise, is that uh, there's a lot of open source projects and that creates a lot of good communities. That's why we are here, and, and basically that, that is the thing that uh, keeps us kind of like growing and creating new stuff. And I think it's also kind of part of the DeFi. Definitely understand that there will be companies building products on smart contracts and on Ethereum, but I would always prefer something that's open source. Uh, so uh, about DeFi yielding, so there's different kinds of DeFi projects out there. Uh, there's yielding DeFi projects, which I, call like a project that actually gives you some sort of like uh, interest. So there is the pooled ones. So obviously we know Compound. Compound has doing pretty well. They have uh, over 100 million locked assets, I think now. And basically then we have, uh, we're building a, uh, at Aave also basically a um, kind of lending pool mechanisms with the interest, interest swaps. We have a model that we have basically order matching based lending protocol. Uh, which is Eatland, and there's one other one, for example, Landroid from uh, India. 
And then we have marching lending protocols like BYDX, uh, uh, full Chrome, and Nuo Lending. And these are basically when you can actually borrow and trade on the same, uh, at the same time with leverage. And then we have, of course, like DEXs and liquidity pools with some strategies you can earn their yield as well. So this is kind of like the whole, uh, not the whole, so it, people don't get offended if, if there is not like all the projects. It's just like a few of these that I wanted to put there and, and, and as an example. So these projects are basically providing uh, some sort of like income for the depositor, whether it's lending, trading. Uh, and the interesting part is like from 2017, December, until uh, 2019, April, the whole DeFi space has grown over 500%. And it's, it's, it's a lot in like the percentual growth. In, in a way, like how much, how big the DeFi space now is, it's pretty small. So I, I, I think in different calculations, there might be some so, something like uh, uh, 10,000 or, or 20,000 DeFi users at the moment. So it's very concentrated liquidity. Most of the liquidity or, or the locked assets or people who are borrowing or lending, uh, it, it's basically drawn into few bigger uh, players. Um, but there's pretty interesting growth uh, going on. And, and I think there's um, a lot of potential. And, and for example, in Compound, you have roughly 1,500 different borrowers. On the lender size, you have 5,000 lenders. So I think there's uh, interesting growth here. And currently we have over half a billion, well, now it's under half a billion actually, uh, locked assets. So how you measure like the DeFi success is the amount of locked assets. So usually like what's been funny in this space is like we create our own terms and, <laughs> and kind of our own yardsticks. So in traditional finance, you usually calculate like the outstanding loan balances, like uh, that's the, basically your yardstick for growth, and 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 basically in DeFi, it's it's how much assets people are looking into a, a protocol. Uh, and of course, there's the uh, traded part of the DeFi, and obviously people know uh, there's Uniswap, IDEX, Kyber, and 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 uh, AirSwap, and so forth, and ZeroX. So that's also like a, a part of the uh, DeFi space. Now, why we're talking basically about staking as a service? Uh, well, basically. Staking a service is, is more or less about um, the fact that there are some protocols that are not uh, proof of work that basically um, allow you to lock assets and get yield when you're confirming blocks, right? So basically, you're actually staking your funds into this protocol. And the thing is, like, what this staking a service does, it kind of like provides, uh, I mean, kind of like ability to people who doesn't met certain requirements or, or doesn't want to go all the work related to staking uh, to stake into different protocols. So basically you might have a person who just doesn't have the technical capabilities or understanding or enough assets. For example, you, you need a uh, vast amount of assets to, lo to, to basically stake in Compound and you need basically also um, technical capabilities, uh, servers and so forth. And also you need to spend time into uh, creating this kind of like uh, staking environment for yourself. So instead of doing that, uh, you have a service provider who actually does all, all of this for you and you basically uh, kind of trust them. But th the thing is like most of the stuff that I have seen and, and basically is non-custodial staking, so you don't even need to do the custody. But we are looking a bit of the custodial side today. I, I know it's kind of like uh, custody is always a controversial thing, but uh, there's always something, some stuff that can be build, build, build there as well. But the thing is that uh, what you eventually do in, in the, when you're using staking as a service, you're basically dividing the, the, the profit with the uh, service provider. Now the ecosystem, there is a lot of different projects. There's Stake, Cap Stake Capital, which is a European one, uh, Stake US from uh, US, and there's a bunch of other ones and, and coming up uh, all the time. And one of the protocols is, for example, Cosmos, uh, LifePeer, Tezos, uh, Loom, and Ethereum when Ethereum goes to 2.0. So basically that's interesting there as well. And what we are talking is basically the DeFi part because that's like the interesting part because what the staking as a service tries to do is to make staking easier. So they have a reach out to the larger, larger audience. And where the kind of like, uh, uh, sweet spot is, is is in this particular image. So basically, here's the uh, U.S. retail banking uh, deposits and deposits growth. So for the last, uh, oh, well, it's 2009. 
luckily the 2008 has been left away from this, but uh, it's kind of a controversial year. But uh, uh, the, the amount of deposit has grown all the time, also because like interest is compounding all the time. But what we can see from this particular image is that basically the uh, non-interesting bearing uh, deposits are going down and people are basically taking more interest bearing deposits. And in this current economy that you have in, in, in the traditional finance is that basically there isn't much yield that you can actually uh, get. And this is another interesting figure here, uh, if you guys see. So this is from high street current accounts from UK. So there's, I, I mean, you look any country uh, in the Western world, for example, whether it's US, uh, France, uh, Germany, UK, um, you will find more or less same figures or, or even like uh, lower figures. So basically, uh, uh, Lloyd's Bank is offering 0.05% to 1% uh, for for basically saving accounts, I mean, current accounts. And, and pretty much what you can mostly get is under a percent, or if it's like a longer deposit, fixed deposit, you can get a couple of percents or, or a bit more. So if you think about like looking at the back, um, like, or not not the recent years, but a bit in the history, like people rem still remember getting more yields on their deposits, but because we are in kind of like interesting financial economy now, uh, it doesn't make sense to pay people, uh, normal consumers like me and you guys. I mean, banks don't want to pay you because they get free money from the central banks. Uh, so they can basically, based on the money multiplier, create the money from the debt. So they don't need our money anymore, right? So what we consumers are now doing, we are looking into different kinds of uh, alternative finance, like peer-to-peer -peer lending or any kind of like a new financial instrument or crowdfunding, for example. And there is the part where DeFi like plays around because if you look at the DeFi space now, uh, there's some interesting figures here. For example, in Compound, you can get easily 18, 19%, DYDX, 18% as well, and, and uh, Fulcrum, uh, 15%. And, in Eatland, which is the um, our marketplace, basically ten percent. So on on Dai. So I think the key is here, kind of like uh, we're in a momentum where basically in traditional finance, consumers are left into the corner, and, and basically your money isn't worth anything. So I will repeat: your money isn't worth anything in traditional finance at the moment because banks can basically create the money of your debt. So Everyone who has here any funds on their bank account, someone is paying interest on that. That money was created by some, cert, so, some specific debt and basically that debt money goes further from payments. For example, if you buy a house, it goes further and someone is left to pay that interest. Now, and what's cool in the DeFi space that we are getting this kind of yields and it's just like pretty, pretty cool. We have actually, this is from our, uh, kind of lending pools, but it, it says 25.5 per year, but <laughs> that's on Kovan, so it's like Kovan die, so it's like, it's not worth anything at the moment, but the thing is that, like, when you see this kind of yields, and you're like a person from, like, traditional world, uh, you get pretty, in like, excited, because even, like, if you look at the whole DeFi space now, it's more or less, like, over collateralized loans or lending in general, and, like, if you think about, like, I've never seen anything like this where people are actually super excited about lending. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's, it's not the most interesting thing, but that's like where we are now because we get like this yield. So they, they, they do have an effect, right? I mean, if, if, if we in, in, in basically in, in, uh, in DeFi space, we're like very interested to see this kind of figures. I, I think like the no traditional finance uh, consumers will be as well in the same way. And um, the thing is, like, what's the process now to participate in DeFi? That's like the, the big bottleneck that we have. We are improving user experiences, so it's, it's way more better than it used to be a couple of years ago. But currently, basically, what's the drill is, is you need to have, of course, fiat. Uh, then you need to convert to Ethereum. You need to have acknowledged, like, basically how the whole blockchain system works to kind of some way sec secure yourself and to use... Uh, you, you need to even know how to send a transaction, right? Then you need to convert those Ethereum in DAI, and you need to leave a bit of Ethereum to send that DAI, right? So you need to be 
like kind of like that uh, careful. You need to have a MetaMask or some way, some some way to connect to the Web3. Uh, you, you need to uh, take remember your seeds and back them up and so forth. Like you need to self custody yourself. Then you can enter basically the DeFi space and then you can actually deposit. So we have all these kind of steps here in between so that the traditional person can move his funds from his basically saving accounts to the DeFi to get to this high yield interest. And what the uh, staking as a service will basically do if they kind of like take the uh, custodial part where they actually have a uh, kind of like a uh, person that is, is used to traditional banks, traditional yields, uh, haven't got any experience on, on blockchain, but wants to get access to those yields. So he has uh, the funds, he gives those funds to a, a service provider, and that service provider gives interest in that particular currency. And uh, all the DeFi stuff, for example, the conversion to, to Ethereum and then to DAI and eventually staking to the DeFi works kind of like in behind, right? So like this, this way, a traditional person from the traditional finance can actually uh, have an easy access to those DeFi yields without like going all those loops uh, of, 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 of uh, going yourself, like installing a wallet and, and everything kind of this. Because like I, I'm pretty sure like many people will quit, quit in the middle of the process, even though like we, we definitely know that the model you should participate in DeFi is the like the non-custodial, that goes without saying. But uh, this is just a way to basically get more people into uh, the DeFi yields. So eventually, like uh, what I wanted to give away from this talk is is that uh, staking as a service or any kind of like uh, this kind of like application where uh, you're trying to interact with tra traditional finance and take the fiat and convert in between and, and deposit uh, that can kind of like indirectly impact the DeFi usage on the deposit sides. And that's interesting because like, uh, if you look at the market size of how much there is, the people are holding funds in, in basically in, in traditional finance in the deposits and look at, looking at the current um, uh, basically amount of funds are locked in DeFi, which is basically roughly half a billion, uh, that could grow like substantially. And basically, because interaction with DeFi becomes uh, way easier, uh, it takes less time, and those yields are attractive. So it's a um, it's 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 kind of like a win-win situation. But of course, other things to consider is that um, it's we're not sure how long the rates will hold up. Like I mean, if uh, if we get like another half a billion into the DeFi, the rates will go half from that. So so basically. I would even say that maybe now it's the moment to actually try to get more people and try to get, build this kind of like gateways to DeFi and let people to operate and, and get more like mainstream. Um, and yeah, and the custody of course is the issue in, in, in my view. I, I definitely think like if you're like the idea of DeFi is that you can interact basically without giving your funds to custody. But I definitely understand there's people who are taking the risk of the custody and trusting service provider. And I, I, I know like I, I'm very myself like into non-custodial services. And sometimes when I say this, I get a lot of bullshit like that. No, you, yeah, like you can only have like, that's not, that's you're giving a custody and that's perfectly fine because I want to give custody at some, to, so, to certain extent, to certain services and have the trust because like, like 99.9% .9 of everything is based on trust and that's perfectly fine. And in some places I want uh, the trust and kind of like, uh, I could like say, it's kind of like the Bitcoin maximalist thing, you know, <laughs> like it, you, sh you, you don't need to be maximalist in the whole uh, like non-custodial custody thing because like you can choose where you want to be non-custodian and where you want to have custody. And that's like the, the key thing, but uh, of course, more non-custodial services is, is better than custodian. So yeah, uh, yeah. So why we had this talk is basically uh, more to kind of like see how you can connect to different things. And also because uh, we do a lot of DeFi, we have been building for a uh, long time now, and I think the space is growing pretty well. And, and, and basically, uh, yeah. And when we are keeping 
the DeFi kind of like pure open source. Uh, we have a good community. There's a nice Telegram group, uh, D underscore FI. So basically, if you want to learn more about DeFi or just uh, you're, you have enough time or you're boring that you want to discuss with other people who like DeFi, that's a pretty nice place. And we have a Telegram community as well, uh, which is Avesome, like uh, awesome with, with the double A and um, V. So basically, if you want to ask questions about us, uh, about Eatland or basically our lending pool, so we're there. And uh, now I think it's pretty much the time for the uh, happy hour. And if you guys are still on your feet, uh, we have at eight with MakerDAO, basically the happy hour. <laughs> So basically there's QR codes there. If you scan the QR codes, you will basically claim two die. And if you stake those two die into a uh, beer pool, you will get one beer as an interest. So that's a kind of a proof of concept of our uh, interest pools. Actually, now that I'm thinking, what we, have, what we should have done is that uh, you could swap the interest from beer to like a drink or cider or something. You know, because not everyone drinks beer. That's something that we could do for the next event. But thanks, guys. Thank you.